I'm Bob Short, and this is Reflections on Georgia Politics, sponsored by Young Harris College and the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. We're delighted today to have as our guest David Morrison, a former reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and currently Vice President for Communications and Publications at Brunel University. David, we're delighted to have you. Thanks, Bob. It's good to see you again. You came to Atlanta all the way from Birmingham, Alabama. Tell us about that journey. Well, it was a, it was a bit circuitous. Um, <laughs> it started in a little log cabin. Actually, it um, <laughs> uh, wasn't a log cabin at all. I grew up in uh, uh, kind of a, a working class family, uh, a very unusual setting in the, in the South. And you hear all these stories about uh, people growing up in the rural South. I grew up kind of in the urban South in, in Birmingham. And uh, uh, first, uh, my formative years were uh, over in the Inslee section and uh, very, very working class uh, uh, neighborhood. Um, most of the people I knew worked in the steel industry or the coal industry. And uh, my, my mother had uh, several brothers. All of, the, all of those guys were steel workers and my father um, had brothers who were steel workers. He was an electrician. They were all union guys. Uh, so it was kind of an unusual uh, environment for what, uh, what you think of uh, as the South. Um, but I um, uh, grew up there. Uh, we moved uh, when I was about 12 years old out to the suburbs, but it was still not too far out of Birmingham. So it was still, we were still Birmingham address. And, uh, it was a very interesting time in Birmingham in the 50s and the 60s. Mm -hmm. Describe for us, if you will, the mood in Birmingham during that period. It was um, it, it was very strange. I mean, even, even as a kid, you could you could kind of pick up on the strangeness of what was going on there. I mean, people knew the difference between right and wrong, and they knew that a lot of things that were happening in Birmingham uh, with the racial tensions and everything were wrong, but they, they uh, uh, I guess, felt powerless to do anything about it or, or didn't want to do anything about it because it would you know, make them choose sides. And, and sometimes it was very, very dangerous to choose sides in those days. Um, it was, um, uh, there seemed to be constant racial tension, and even in families. I mean, you, you, uh, my, my family was fairly typical, I think. Uh, you know, we had uh, people all over the place in, in their attitudes and uh, racial attitudes, and um, uh, you know, some, some were, were uh, I guess, extremely racist, and some were not. And, and that was pretty much the way the community was. Uh, again, you, the, the people that you would expect to be out and involved uh, in any kind of community struggle or chaos like that were absent from it. The, the, the church people that are so active today, uh, particularly white churches, specifically the white churches, were among the missing. They, they were not... Uh, uh, if anything, the, uh, the the sermons that you were hearing from the pulpits were uh, were were against uh, the struggle that was going on in the streets of Birmingham. Mm -hmm. You went to public school. Public school, yes, totally segregated. Totally segregated. Uh, in the, uh, both in the city of Birmingham and then later in, in high school in uh, in Jefferson County schools, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, they were totally totally segregated. And then it was off to college. Then it was off to college. Um, I was still fairly young. I'd, I, I like to say that I was a prodigy in high school. I'd, I'd, uh, Birmingham City Schools in those days, uh, uh, they didn't have any kind of gifted programs or programs for accelerated students like you find now. So what they did was double promote you. And I got double promoted in the first grade. and, and uh, it was all downhill from there, but uh, <laughs> academically, anyhow, and in, in the uh, uh, but it resulted in me graduating from high school when I was 16, and 
so I was off to college. I had just turned 17 when I left, uh, I left home uh, to go to college in West Texas to a little Baptist college out there, Wayland Baptist College. Basketball. Basketball, women's basketball. Women's basketball. We heard all the all the uh, hoorah this year about the uh, the NCA or the team that uh, had had the most consecutive victories. Uh, University of Connecticut. I don't remember what the number was. It was something like 80 or 90. That's not true. The most consecutive victories by a college team was in the 130s by the Hutcherson Flying Queens of Wayland Baptist College. They were the premier team. Now, they didn't play in the NCAA in those days. There was no Title IX, so they had to, uh, no women's sports to speak of in any college. So they had to play in the AAU, the Amateur Athletic Union. And they were sponsored by, uh, uh, by the college and by a local Beechcraft uh, airplane dealer. Uh, and their gimmick was they flew to all their basketball games. Uh, and they, they played internationally. They were really good. They play, it was the old days when they, uh, uh, women's basketball in those days had six players, and you know, two, uh, only two of them could cross the center line at any time, and, and you had to bounce the ball twice and either pass or shoot. Uh, and it was amazing to see those girls running a fast break with that kind of rule and structure, <laughs> but they did it. Uh, they, they'd gotten uh, trapped one time in Oklahoma, I believe, when they were out playing someone, and, when the, the, the team was first coming together and really starting to um, uh, uh, to play well, um, and they, they were in some town in Oklahoma and they got snowed in, and they were in the same hotel with a visiting team, the Harlem Globetrotters. And they went to the gym and the Globetrotters showed them some moves and they put that into their pregame show and it was, it was like watching the Globetrotters. It was the most amazing thing and, and they were really, really good. From there to Baylor. Yeah, I, uh, I actually started, uh, one of my jobs at, at Wayland was, uh, well, let me back up a little bit. I was in Birmingham and just, just going to college. Um, the, the school was so small that they, they had a little program where an upperclassman would write a letter, kind of adopt a, an incoming freshman as a pen pal. And the person that adopted me was, uh, happened to be the editor of the student newspaper, a woman named uh, Marty Clay. And Marty, I never met her or anything, but she was writing me and you know, uh, we, we got along pretty well in the mail. And she kept saying stuff like, well, when you get out here, you're going to write for the student newspaper. Well, I'd never really thought about that. I was pretty good in English, and, uh, but I never really thought about it. But when I get to get to Wayland, she uh, she made me do it, and uh, I, I couldn't I couldn't type. I didn't know how to type, and she made me write a column. Of, uh, the first thing I wrote was uh, just a personal column about what it's like to be a freshman in college, and uh, it took me about three days because I was literally. And I never learned to type, but uh, I, uh, you know, by the time I graduated from college and took my typing test in the Army, I could type like 60 words a minute with four fingers. But, uh, uh, but I got interested in journalism. Uh, and, uh, part of my student work was, uh, uh, was as, sports, as publicist for the sports teams in the college. And, and to make a little extra money, I, I, I got to write, uh, uh, cover high school football games uh, on weekends for the local paper. And they, they gave me, you know, $10. And I think, what, you can get paid for this sort of thing? And uh, so I, that's how it started. And, and I, really, uh, I really enjoyed it and wanted to major in journalism. But Wayland was so small, it didn't have a major. And uh, I'd always wanted to go to Baylor. Uh, so I transferred to Baylor and, uh, and majored in journalism, basically transferred and started all over again. Mm -hmm. But it was a uh, very professionally oriented journalism program at Baylor. Uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the, we had a daily newspaper in those days in, on the campus, plus uh, you, uh, you had to work for the local paper again on Friday nights uh, when the local newspaper had a short staff, uh, you know, covering football games and police beat and different, whatever came up. They didn't pay you for that. That was just part of your education. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I graduated from Baylor in, 
uh, let me say January of 1968, mm -hmm. and um, came back to Alabama to work for the Montgomery Advertiser. Alabama Journal was the uh, afternoon paper in those days, mm -hmm. and that was my first job. And mm -hmm. um, uh, I uh, was waiting on my diploma to arrive in the mail from Baylor, but what came first was my draft notice, mm -hmm. right during the Tet Offensive. So you became a fighting man. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> uh, I, I was drafted into the Army and, and um, did my basic training at Fort Benning and uh, went, then moved to, uh, for advanced training to Fort Ord, California. And I was in the infantry. But uh, because I had the degree um, in um, journalism, I had a, they, they gave me a secondary military occupation specialty as a public information specialist in the Army. But I was also, uh, when I was at Wayland, I, uh, it, it was a very unusual little school out there in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it was, had a strong, in addition to the women's basketball, had a strong international relations program. Um, and my roommate in my junior year was the son of the ambassador from Thailand, and we got along famously. But I, you know, I was paying attention to what was happening around uh, with the war and with the with the student movement, and I, I was feeling very strongly about the Vietnam War, and and uh, uh, you know, again, one of those. Uh, uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't things, uh, where I, I, I always felt, uh, always believed in compulsory public service, so I couldn't really be opposed to the draft all that much, uh, but I was also very much opposed to the war, so how do you justify that? Well, I, so I went on into the Army and, and learned that you could apply for a conscientious objector status in the Army which I did, and it was, it was approved, and uh, that uh, didn't set well with a lot of people in Birmingham. But, uh, uh, so when that was approved, the, um, uh, the Army regulations require that you um, lose your combat military occupation. And what they normally, you had to have a job in the Army, so they normally sent you down to Fort Sam Houston, Texas, to train as a medic when you were a conscientious objector. But because I had that secondary MOS, it, uh, it became the primary, and they didn't know what to do with me. So I remember the personnel clerk was looking around and said, I need to make you a medic, but you've already got a job. I need to just find you a job. So he, uh, it just happened that the, uh, the, the hospital at Fort Ord uh, had an opening for a public information specialist. So they put me in that job, and that's where I spent the rest of my time. Mm -hmm. So what happened after the army? Well, I got—I uh, uh, I was looking for a way out. Obviously, like uh, like George Bush, uh, I, I took advantage of the early out program. Uh, only he got—he got 120 days. I'm not sure how he did that. And, uh, but I, I got—I uh, was able to to get accepted into graduate school and uh, get. A, I got out 89 days early to uh, to study journalism at the University of California at Berkeley. And Birmingham so, to Birmingham Berkeley. to the Army to Berkeley. It was culture uh, shock. One right after another. Yes. So, so after you uh, after you left Berkeley, what happened? Well, I um, I was looking for a job, and um, the uh, I kind of made a loop of, of of places I wanted to go to, all the way across the southern crescent of the United States to every every town that had a newspaper of any significance and uh, all the way up to Washington and, and uh, I had had target papers that I wanted to go to work for and I interviewed with the Atlanta Constitution and uh, you know, I have to correct you earlier, I did work for the combined newspapers for about a year but I was always a Constitution guy. They were, they were separate in those days and, and that, that was the paper I liked and admired and that was one I went to and uh, didn't really have anything going at that point, and I interviewed at the number of other papers, and, and I finally uh, I got a job at the Greenville News in South Carolina, and I worked there for about uh, close to a year, and and uh, then got a call from the Constitution, and the job had opened up, 
the um, it was 1972, and the. George Wallace was uh, was making a real strong run for the presidency, and uh, the, the Constitution editors, Bill Shipp amongst them, uh, very political, politically oriented, felt that uh, that the uh, and I, f I think felt correctly that the the uh, center of attention in national politics was going to be focus, uh, focusing in the South. And they wanted a strong, strong, or uh, expanded political team. I don't know how strong it was if they were recruiting me for it. But uh, a, a, a colleague of mine from Montgomery, uh, Milo Dakin, was uh, a very, very strong Wallace guy. He knew Wallace very well, and he had been hired at the Constitution primarily to to cover Wallace. And. Um, Milo helped recruit in a couple of guys that he knew in Alabama. I was one of them. Jim Stewart was another. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, I started work for the Constitution in June of 1972. Mm -hmm. And immediately got involved in the political coverage. Mm -hmm. we were, uh, uh, we were uh, in the middle of a uh, United States Senate race. Uh, to, to, uh, David Gambrell, had, uh, Richard Russell had died. Uh, David Gambrell had been appointed by Jimmy Carter to fill the unexpired term, and, and the uh, to, to, to the, the term ended, or the election next election cycle came up, and, and had to stand for election. So um, uh, we had a, a full blown campaign going on for that U.S. Senate seat. Mm -hmm. Gambrell was technically an incumbent, but had not been there very long, so really had few advantages as an incumbent. Mm -hmm. So it was a wide open seat. Were, were you with the Constitution when you covered the Birmingham church bombing trial? Yeah, that was some years later. I mean, I actually, um, uh, actually left home the weekend to go to college the weekend that the church was bombed, the uh, 16th Street Baptist Church where the four little girls were killed. And I, you know, I went up, um, I, I didn't really have many of the details of what was going on because uh, me and my roommate were driving cross country th th those two days. And um, uh, after we got after we got to Texas, we uh, uh, started hearing more about it, and it was pretty, uh, uh, you know, pretty horrible. And and um, uh, you know, we kind of had a stigma attached to us being from Birmingham. Uh, in, the school in West Texas is very, very, uh, I mean, it, it, it was a very open school. Um, the half, not half, excuse me, about a third of the student body was from somewhere else in the world. And I lived across the hall from a, a boy from Nigeria, for example. And, uh, you, know, you, you know, that talking about culture shock from a, a kid that had grown up in totally segregated society in Alabama and all of a sudden you know, you're, you're, you're sharing a dormitory space with, uh, uh, with a guy not, not only who's black but is from Nigeria and, and um, it, so I mean there were different attitudes about uh, uh, I mean I, I felt I, I felt a little prejudice being from Birmingham and I, I think rightly so I think people were uh, kind of sizing me up but I, uh, I've lost my train here, but you'd asked me about uh, the trial. The trial. Mm -hmm. um, so that was going on, and, and this, I guess the trial occurred in about 1977, and um, uh, the Attorney General from the state of Alabama, a guy named Bill Baxley, had opened some of the old civil rights cases, a lot of the church bombing and terrorism cases that uh, uh, had uh, fallen by the boards, had never been prosecuted successfully, and never never prosecuted at all. Uh, where uh, Baxley was going after some of them, the most notorious one, of course, was the uh, 16th Street Church bombing, and he uh, uh, went after. Um, uh, he was able to get uh, FBI records and 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 go after the guy that actually had had a great deal to do with it, uh, Robert Shambliss, and and. Uh, uh, for me, it was kind of a, a cathartic moment uh, uh, 
really uh, had kind of vowed I never would, uh, never would like Birmingham, uh, even though it was my home, and, and never would, certainly never would go back there to live. But uh, I, I, I felt if we could, you know, get some closure on that sort of stuff, uh, it was uh, it was. It was an interesting time for me, an interesting experience to go to that trial and mm -hmm. cover it. What was the trial like? Did it reopen old racial wounds? I, I think it did, but it opened them to help clean them out and let them heal a little bit more. And uh, it, it was, you know, I, I met uh, during the trial um, the father of one of the one of the little girls that was killed, uh, Chris McNair, uh, and his wife Maxine, and uh, and as bitter as bitter as they should have been, I mean, even in the testimony, none of that came through. Uh, they were looking, they were looking for for closure, certainly, uh, but uh, they were they were really looking for for justice, not only for for the for their family and the death of their daughter, but for this, for the city. And, uh, and Chris, uh, their, their whole attitude was, uh, uh, you know, still, uh, after all that had happened, they were still willing to embrace the rest of the community if it would come together. And I think it, uh, it, it helped galvanize a little of that. Mm -hmm. Did you know Eugene Connor? Bull Connor. Uh, I knew certainly who he was. It was a, uh, a triumvirate of uh, uh, people who basically ran the city. Uh, it was a, uh, a guy named Jabo Wagner and, and, and Bull Connor, and everybody had nicknames. I, mean, I have to confess, I'm, I'm Butch. Um, yeah. um, so, um, and, and then the, the mayor was a guy named Art Haynes, who was. Uh, uh, as as uh, as it turned out, was the counsel for the defense in the Shambliss trial. The mayor, the, the former mayor. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's get back to Atlanta. You're now at the Atlanta Constitution. You're out on the uh, campaign trail. You covered such people as Gary Hart when he ran for president, I think, and for the '88 election. Right. What was he like? He was kind of he was kind of interesting. He reminded me a great deal of uh, of, of Jimmy Carter um, in in terms of his personality. He was uh, uh, he, he was he's certainly uh, just a brilliant guy, uh, but he was he was hard to get to know personally. And I mean, we didn't know why <laughs> why he was so uh, secretive and standoffish. It was kind of a uh, kind of a story about him, and uh, I mean, we've all heard the the story out of the spy novels about the uh, the Russian, uh, uh, the Soviet uh, um, baby that was uh, planted in the United States. Yuri, the big Yuri rumor, and, and uh, the idea was for this this uh, spy in the making uh, to. Uh, uh, to rise in prominence in national politics and, and, and get into a position of power and then turn over all the secrets, or whatever. And, uh, and Hart, uh, you know, he, I think he, if my memory serves, I think he was, uh, uh, his name was something like Hart Pence, and he changed his name to Hart, and, uh, and he spoke almost flawless Russian. Uh, so, uh, you know, people were saying, here's your Yuri. And that, uh, that comes back to a, a story uh, later on, uh, or maybe I'll just go ahead and tell it now. And uh, uh, when Hart, uh, Hart had his undoing uh, um, uh, with the uh, affair that he had with uh, a young woman named Donna Rice, uh, turned out that she had been, uh, I think, a, a cheerleader and a student at the University of South Carolina and the top political science professor at the University of South Carolina in those days was a guy named Lee Atwater, who would go on and, and be the, you know, uh, Reagan's brain and, and, and the guy that really uh, kind of escalated uh, uh, divisive politics. Uh, but uh, Lee was an interesting fellow. I, I, you know, as a political writer, you'd, 
you go in and out of communities, and he was always, uh, if you go to Columbia, South Carolina, you saw Atwater. And so I, I knew him, and, and when, the, when the Donna Rice uh, story broke, uh, after it had broken, I, I still communicated with Atwater from time to time, and I accused him of making her his Yuri, you know, to, uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, that, uh, you know, all he all he had to do was train her up and then, then plant her with a uh, as a groupie with a rock and roll band and wait for a Democratic presidential contender. Uh, 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 uh. Let's he, talk about. He never some, denied it. So. Uh, let's talk about some of the other interesting campaigns you covered. Uh, you uh, covered Carter uh, in his run for the presidency. I started covering Carter. Uh, to, to, to some extent, I was on the Capitol staff for the Constitution in the last uh, year and a half uh, that Carter was governor. Uh, so I, I knew him from there, and, and uh, I was always involved in politics and uh, from the time I got to the Constitution. And uh, Carter, of course, was in, as you would always encounter Carter. Uh, in fact, everybody uh, in just about every race, if I can make a generality, seemed to be running against Carter, no matter what race it was, from uh, uh, you know, from 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 governor to uh, you know, mayor of Atlanta. There was uh, Carter was always an issue in the campaigns, and, and uh, you know, there was a um, uh, so just plenty of things going on, and, and the, uh, so I, I was uh, always uh, around. Carter when he was governor. Mm -hmm. During that period, Lester Maddox was lieutenant governor. That's right. And and they didn't always agree. I don't think they ever agreed, uh, or so it seemed. <laughs> it was um, uh, Lester Maddox was the uh, you know, president of the Senate, presiding officer of the Senate as lieutenant governor, and and uh, seemed to. Um, his agenda seemed to be to stop Carter's, no matter what it was. And, and Carter had done some very interesting things as governor. Uh, you, you talk about uh, in in history, uh, kind of watershed terms and elections, and and um, uh, Carter. You know, I, I don't know where you. Uh, where you come, I know where you come down on when the New South began with, the, with Sanders or with Carter, uh, but I think it was uh, it, it, it was really cumulative with a lot of a lot of things that were happening. Certainly, the the state legislature gained its independence from the governor's office in '66, and, and I think that was part of the deal to get Lester elected governor. Is uh, uh, you know, from uh, or we'll 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 vote for you. We'll break this tie and give you the governorship. But uh, we got to have an independent independent house house of representatives. And but still, there was still uh, even through the Maddox administration and through Carter's, uh, the, the, there were still things that weren't quite modern. And the, the uh, executive branch, not just the governor's office, was, was one of those things. And Carter, uh, his uh, cornerstone in his administration was reorganizing state government and uh, consolidating a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of power at the executive level of government, of state government, that had uh, been kind of diffused all over. Uh, you know, certainly that's true in, uh, uh, in, in all the operations that became part of the great Department of Human Resources, all the natural resources stuff, a lot of that stuff was out in the counties. And, and uh, uh, when, when Carter brought about that reorganization, he, he didn't make a lot of friends. Uh, and it's kind of, um, you, you hear about, you look around at what's going on today with all the campaigning to dismantle Obamacare, and I can't help but think back on those days because everybody that was running for anything wanted to undo Carter's reorganization. That was certainly uh, uh, Maddox's intent. And it wasn't finished. It was still going on while we were going there. Uh, and and a, lot of, a lot of things that he was doing, in, particularly in natural resources and environmental protection, um, Maddox people in the Senate were lined up to stop. Uh, from um, you know, Roscoe Dean, who was chairman of the Natural Resources Committee, Maddox uh, 
put him in the job, fought everything Carter did. Uh, and if it got through the Natural Resources Committee, uh, which was kind of balanced and kind of occasionally leaned toward helping Carter out, the whole committee, uh, then they had Malin London uh, in the Rules Committee stopping it. So you had that kind of tension going on all the time, in the, certainly in the time that I was there. Mm -hmm. Let's go back, David, if you will, to 1967. You mentioned breaking the tie. Uh, that was a very historical election. Yeah. Why do you think that uh, Bo Calloway, who was by far the better financed, the stronger candidate, lost that race? Well, I, you know, I, I wasn't here then, but I, I, I'll, only um, what I hear from talking to people and from reading about it was uh, was the um, the write-in can campaign. Uh, Governor Arnold got just enough votes to keep uh, keep everybody from um, or anybody from winning a direct majority, and and um, um, I don't know that I don't know that he that that, that, that really stopped him. I, I, I presume that most of the Arnold vote came out of, off the Democratic side. I presume that uh, I may be wrong about that. So Bo Calloway probably got all he was going to get. Mm -hmm. It was going to be a close race, but he, he pretty much had those. I mean, you, you, you didn't have the, uh, the rigid alignment of the parties that you have now. I mean, Georgia still doesn't have that, but uh, it certainly, uh, uh, I mean, I don't even think the uh, Republicans had a primary in those days. I mean, it was just, it was convention, all convention in, in those days, and uh, uh, it didn't matter where you voted. I mean, you could vote any way you wanted to vote. So I think he probably got what he was going to get. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I really don't know. Did you cover the Maddox administration? As governor? Mm -hmm. No, yeah. no, no. He was lieutenant governor by the time I got here. Yeah, so, but you, you, you did cover the uh, 1974 election. When I did, yes. When Maddox ran against George Busby. Right. What do you remember about that race? Well, it was uh, it was really a very interesting race. Uh, again, it was all going to be fought out in the Democratic primary. Uh, I think the uh, uh, the Republicans um, uh, it, was, it was pretty much preordained that their candidate was going to be Ronnie Thompson, the mayor of Macon. Uh, I think he ran against uh, uh, his closest competitor was uh, an Atlanta man named uh, Harold Dye. And um, Thompson just had the, uh, uh, you, you see what's going on today with Rick Perry, um, you know, the, the problems that the other Republican candidates are having in, in, in that primary fight. There was no way you could get to the right of Ronnie Thompson, no way. And everybody was trying to do that and they just couldn't succeed and, and he had that, uh, uh, he, had, he had that strong uh, conservative base locked up, mm -hmm. strong law and order. They called him Machine Gun Ronnie Thompson. I think he, uh, because he wanted to arm the Macon police force with automatic weapons to uh, help put down civil rights uh, disputes. I don't know. It was a, but he was, he, he had that pretty much sewn up. The Democratic uh, candidates, the Democratic field was, um, uh, because of all that was going on uh, with, uh, uh, you know, as I said earlier, Carter was an issue. Uh, so it seemed that everybody was trying to distance themselves uh, from Carter to get a little bit to the right of Lester on on the subject, and uh, you know Lester was against everything, and they, they the other candidates, some of them who were very strong uh, Carter friends, Bert Lance and, and uh, David Gambrell was in that race, I believe, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, you know, uh, Bobby Rowan. Uh, and Busby wasn't anti-Carter, he was from the same part of the state. But they, uh, that seemed to be, they, they seemed to be kind of focusing on, you know, running against Carter. Uh, but Busby was, was the more interesting of the candidates. Very early on, when he, when he announced uh, his candidacy, he was uh, chairman of the House Appropriations Committee. 
very well known in the legislature, very well known in, in South Georgia uh, around his county, but he, uh, nowhere else. I mean, I think, he, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't even an approval poll, it was just a name recognition poll. And he was in single digits when he started out. Nobody knew who he was. But he, his internal polling was probably, no, I think it, it definitely was better than anybody else's because he figured that uh, uh, very quickly that, that the people, the voters, didn't really, they weren't all balled up in this anti-Carter stuff. And they kind of liked the new state government organization. It was working pretty well. Uh, so he, he declared from the get-go, I remember his speech, was that there's only two candidates in this race, me and Lester Maddox. And he began running against Lester and, and running against the politics of the past. Uh, and as a result, he didn't have to distance himself from Carter. He didn't get all caught up in, in, in that sort of thing. He ran strictly against Lester. And, and by running against the, uh, the, uh, the Lester Maddox bugaboo, you know, the big racist Lester Maddox, uh, he, uh, he was able to keep the focus uh, on, on that, uh, away from the issues like the reorganization. And uh, he proved very successful. He, uh, he, he got his runoff battle with Lester and then cleaned his clock. Lester, uh, you know, Lester got all that conservative vote that he was going to get the first time around and didn't get much more than that in the runoff. A workhorse. Workhorse, not a show horse. That's right. Was, was Busby's motto. What are some of the other campaigns you covered? Oh, it was uh, uh, just about everything that moved. I, the first, my first uh, exposure to Ronnie Thompson was, uh, was he was running for Congress against Bill Stuckey and uh, you know, I, I, you know the, that was kind of interesting to get into uh, South Georgia, and Middle Georgia, and, and cover that campaign. Uh, I was involved um, in the um, uh, congressional campaign for the 5th District and when um, uh, Andy Young was running uh, for the first time uh, in running against, uh, I think the, the seat was held when I got to Georgia by a Republican, white Republican named Fletcher Thompson. And um, Andy was, uh, was uh, you know, it, it was Andy's time. And he, the district was pretty evenly split, as I recall. It was about 50% uh, uh, black, uh, but not, not a majority black. And he, so he had to win by, by, uh, by getting some white votes, which he did very successfully. And, and, uh, certainly turned that whole district uh, around and, and Georgia politics around. Who, who was in that race? I don't remember. Um, Rodney Cook was the Republican. Rodney. Mm -hmm. Rodney also ran for governor. Right. Good. You covered a lot of city politics too. Well, I covered it uh, being, you know, working for an Atlanta newspaper at the state capitol. You, you got involved with that. Um, I, um, um, I covered a little bit of city politics. I wouldn't say a lot. And, uh, you know, mostly it was in a, a fill-in role. And, uh, but uh, kind of interestingly, when I, uh, when I got to Atlanta, I had, I had completed all my degree requirements at uh, from a master's degree at, at, at Berkeley, but I hadn't written a thesis. And is in a journalism program, uh, they you, you had an option of, of writing either an academic thesis with a lot of footnotes, or or a, kind of a long form piece of journalism, almost a kind of a book length uh, piece. And uh, uh, the most interesting thing that I thought was happening when I first got to Atlanta was the uh, was the Atlanta mayor's race. And even though I wasn't covering it. I decided to write my thesis about that 73 campaign, uh, which uh, uh, you know, resulted in the election of the first African American mayor. Um, but it was a uh, it was it was teaming uh, or pitting uh, the incumbent mayor Sam Massell, very liberal progressive mayor, against um, Maynard Jackson, who was who was the uh, African American candidate was. Uh, uh, president of the Board of Aldermen, or uh, Vice Mayor, I think was what they called him in those days. 
and he was uh, he was running uh, for against the incumbent mayor. And uh, so I decided to write my thesis on that. And when I wasn't out doing what I did with the newspaper, I was uh, for, for a few months leading up to that campaign. I was out, uh, you know, riding around with candidates and interviewing people. Mm -hmm. It was uh, kind of interesting. It was a. Um, uh, it was one of those uh, Atlanta campaigns uh, that you hear about and that where the outcome of it's pretty well decided in advance by, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the power structure that existed from, from the days of Mayor Hartsfield uh, to, uh, to kind, of, uh, uh, kind of keep uh, Atlanta from getting all, all cut up and carved up in, in, in divisive political campaigns. So uh, uh, there, there was kind of an understanding between some of the white community power, so-called power structure and the black power structure, uh, which did exist, wasn't mythical, it was there. Uh, and they worked together and worked out a lot of problems. And, and uh, one of the problems they worked out is what they were gonna do about this uh, mayor's race that, that could have divided the city racially. And uh, I think essentially the, uh, the deal was that Maynard Jackson would be the mayor and that the vice mayor would be uh, 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 the white guy, you know, <laughs> from uh, uh, Buddy uh, uh, Folks, uh, who was a, a banker and uh, uh, you know, very much a part of the white power structure. and that. That, that Maynard Jackson would be succeeded by, by Buddy when the time came. And uh, the campaign got interesting when, when Jose Williams, um, who was uh, known as the, uh, uh, the, the rabble rouser, the, the, the street guy, the front guy in the civil rights movement who would go, who would go out into communities all over the South and uh, uh, just literally scare the bejesus out of the uh, out, of, out of political leaders and community leaders, and 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 then uh, smooth talking Andy Young and Julian Bond would come in after, and and they'd say, "Oh, if we get rid of this crazy Jose. We'll talk to these guys." And then, but Jose, who was always out in the streets, uh, decided he would get into the uh, to the uh, vice mayor race or the uh, city council presidency race, and bust the deal. He didn't like the deal, and uh, so he did. And um, uh, surprisingly, uh, uh, I guess the person who was the most surprised by that was Jose. He 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 made a position in the he got a position in the runoff. He he damn near won the thing, and uh, it it turned him around a little bit. He, he I remember him coming into the newsroom uh, when he when he made the runoff, and, and it was the first time anybody had ever seen him in a three piece suit. And he, he decided to become a legitimate candidate and, and uh, actually uh, went on, stayed, uh, he, he didn't win, he didn't win, but uh, he, uh, he stayed on into, um, uh, in, in electoral politics and was ele elected to the legislature. Mm -hmm. Getting back to Southern politics, the area has done a complete swing from totally Democrat to totally Republican. What caused that? Well, it was uh, the Democratic Party in Georgia in those days was the biggest of the big tents. I mean, you had everybody. I mean, you you had you had the ultra ultra liberals and and uh, and, and and the ultra conservatives. Arguably, the the most conservative district in the state in those days was the seventh in uh, Northwest Georgia, and the congressman from that district was Larry McDonald. Who, who was a John Birch Society guy? I mean, you know, that's that's the Tea Party of my day. You know, the, the um, my my daddy even flirted around with the Birch Society for a while when he thought it was a civic club. Uh, but it was, you know, it, it, it was uh, the Tea Parties. You know, no no taxes. Well, this the, the Birch Society was no commies, no communists. And every everything there was all kinds of conspiracy things going on. And McDonald came out of that kind of environment and, and was a Democratic congressman, ultra, ultra conservative. But he was a Democrat. Uh, and then you, you, you go on and you find, uh, 
uh, in that same party, uh, you know, Julian Bond and and and, uh, and John Lewis and, and you know the uh, you know the liberal uh, in in the legislature in those days the. Uh, Tom Murphy, who was a Maddox guy, who was Speaker of the House, uh, you know, he had he uh, 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 probably as anti-Republican a person as I have ever known. I mean, <laughs> he was totally uh, anti-Republican. Although he, he, he claims to have worked pretty well with them, there's that's arguable too. But uh, if you look at his committee chairman when he was the Speaker of the House in in the 70s, uh, he had he had black women. Uh, Jerry Horton was a, a ultra liberal, uh, and then he had um, you know the the, the wool hat guys too. I mean, it, so it was a, it was really a big tent. I, I think it uh, when I got to the uh, state senate, 56 members. I, there were four Republicans, and and three of them were the liberal guys. I mean, <laughs> or, or so they seemed to me. Uh, but I, I think it's just probably what happened. I think it probably just got too big, uh, and 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 politics got more and more divisive, and uh, people, uh, you know, had to had to really take care of their their bases and their uh, you know the Re Republican Party played to that and and built around it and built around the conservative tendencies in the state. They took the old democratic issues. Mm -hmm. uh, there were more. Uh, the democratic issues in those days were, were populist, and, and uh, if you look at you know Nunn, Sam Nunn in the Senate. Uh, I mean, Sam Nunn did not run as a liberal. No way. Uh, but uh, even when he got to Washington, um, there was a. Um, you know concerns that that that, that the uh, Democratic Party was uh, was going off and leaving folks like none and, and uh, uh, I think he was instrumental in forming kind of a, a group of conservatives you know the, what are we calling them now the blue dog Democrats and uh, a, a conserv more conservative leaning Democrats uh, became uh, uh, the, the Democratic leadership conference oh, called DLC DLC and, and um, Nunn was uh, kind of one of the founding members of that to kind of galvanize uh, the conservative Democrats and, and protect them as Democrats. Uh, Bill Clinton was part of that. I mean, it involved governors and and, uh, and elected officials all over the all over the all over the country, mm -hmm. but particularly in the South. At one time, you covered the Georgia Senate when when Zell Miller was lieutenant governor. Yes. Uh, well, he was uh, Lester. I covered the Senate for six years and the uh, or seven years, and um, Lester Maddox was a lieutenant governor. Um, I, I started in basically in the Senate in the '74 session, which was uh, uh, the last. Uh, might have been '73. Yeah, I think I spent two sessions with Lester as lieutenant governor and. Um, and then Zell became, uh, won the uh, 74 election and became lieutenant governor in 75. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so he was, um, but he, he was, he was very interesting. He'd stay in that, he'd stay in that position for a long, long time. I think he still got the record uh, in the nation for the longest serving lieutenant governor. Mm -hmm. uh, Miller did some interesting things when he became lieutenant governor. He surrendered his power of appointing committees to a committee on committee committees, right, right. which was very controversial. And I actually uh, appointed in that uh, a, a Republican committee chairman, Paul Coverdale. Mm -hmm. So uh, he, he took a lot of heat from uh, inside the party, and, and certainly in the in the uh, the leadership of the in, in the Senate. Uh, and the and the speaker, right? Yeah, he finally uh, got his that power back though. I think he realized that he'd made a mistake. Yeah, yeah. Good. What sort of presiding officer was he? He was he was interesting. I mean, he, he was it was it was a night and day difference. Uh, Miller knew knew the Senate, and he knew he he knew how things worked, and and he could actually run the Senate. 
and um, Maddox uh, didn't, you know, I, he'd never read anything about, about parliamentary procedure or anything, so he was the presiding officer. But it was almost like a, a ventriloquist act. Uh, uh, standing beside him was a guy named Mike Paget, and you know somebody would, you know, make a motion on the floor, and Mike would lean over, like, oh, and tell Lester, and Lester would make a ruling. And sometimes he'd he would parrot it just right. Sometimes he'd get it a little bit wrong. But you know, <laughs> uh, but Miller uh, Miller did uh, did know how things worked, and Lester was allowing his advisors uh, to pretty much run things for him. Uh, Gene Holly from Augusta and uh, uh, Malin London I mentioned, and, uh, a number of others, uh, the more conservative uh, uh, members of the Senate were uh, uh, kind, of, kind of helped control Lester and direct his politics uh, a lot more probably than they should have. One of the classic elections was for Congress in the 5th District between two old civil rights friends, Julian Bond and John Lewis. Right. You were there then. Right, I was there actually uh, actually earlier. That, that campaign started shaping up several election cycles earlier. The, uh, in the 70s, because of the uh, Justice Department's riding herd on, on Georgia uh, reapportionment, the, the fifth district, or all the districts, the reapportionment was kind of late in the decade occurring, and Julian uh, Bond was a member of the state senate in those days, and, and uh, Andy Young had the seat and was going into the Carter administration, and so uh, that seat was going to become an open seat. And, you know, I would mentioned earlier that it was kind of equally divided racially. Uh, and, um, but, but it was restructured uh, to give Julian an advantage uh, if, he, if he chose to run for that seat. And, and it was kind of preordained that he would. Uh, but he surprised everybody in that, that first go around in 1977 and, and didn't run. And it became a, an election between Weich Fowler and John Lewis. And the presumption was that John Lewis would win because of the way the district was structured demographically. Uh, but he didn't. Uh, uh, Weich won and, and held the seat for several years, or several, uh, two or three terms. And then it became an open seat again in the, in the 1990s, when, uh, when, in the 80s actually. I'm, I'm losing track of decades here. Uh, when, um, uh, when Fowler ran for the United States Senate. And uh, so Julian at that time decided that he would run and, and John Lewis would run. Um, it, probably Julian Bond would have won that election, but there were, um, uh, there were things happening in his personal life that distracted him. Uh, significantly, and and after he, he did lose, he uh, uh, he kind of he kind of imploded. Mm -hmm. When Weitz left the uh, House of Representatives, uh, he ran for Senate against an incumbent Republican who defeated Herman Talmadge. Right, uh, Mac Mattingly. Right. Do you remember that race? I do. Uh, uh, and Miller. Uh, Miller was in that one too, I believe. Didn't he run? For no, he ran in eighty. He ran against Talmadge at one point. Yeah, nineteen eighty. Yeah. Right, and um, um, yeah, I remember the um, um, Mattingly was uh, was head of the Republican Party. Um, You're right. He was in that race in the Democratic primary. Right, right, right. Against Talmadge, and Talmadge defeated him to go on to lose to right. Right. the Republican. Yeah. And um, Mattingly, is, is, uh, Mattingly was, uh, lived down on the coast and was a uh, IBM sales executive, but he was, he was head, of the, uh, head of the Republican Party, uh, which was very small in those days. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, he certainly, uh, he certainly won because, uh, not, uh, not because he was a Republican, 
I mean, it, it, that transformation still had not occurred. Uh, it was Herman's seat to lose still, and, and he lost it in fine style. He, uh, he, he you know, uh, uh, much celebrated problems about alcoholism and, and uh, taking money from people and, and all, all sorts of things that led to his undoing. All that had, uh, had occurred uh, before and during the campaign. And, and uh, he, uh, I think he, in my recollections, he still almost pulled it off, but Mattingly did emerge victorious. Yeah. Let's, uh, let me ask you a question about the job of a newspaper reporter. Um, wh what does it take to make a good newspaper reporter? Well, I think you have to have pretty much uh, just an insatiable curiosity about everything uh, and, you know, how, how things work and you have to not, not be satisfied with the first answer you get uh, when you start asking questions. You, you, you need to be, um, uh, you kind of need to be open to just about any source of information that you can, that, that, that exists. Uh, uh, not necessarily take it as gospel, but uh, you certainly listen to it and, and um, um, you've got to um, you got to have a little tenacity. Some people might call it stubbornness about uh, uh, sticking to uh, what your hunches are and following up on them. Uh, you know, just mm -hmm. um, you. Um, I, I think you got to be kind of quick on your feet uh, because you you never know what you're going to encounter. You never know what your day is going to be like, and you've got to adjust. Uh, to, to that, plus you got a you got a multitask too. I mean, in, in uh, when I first started, <coughs> excuse me, when I first started with the uh, with the Constitution, um, my city editor was was Bill Shipp. <coughs> and um, is that the famous Bill Shipp or the infamous Bill Shipp? It, it depends on who you ask. And, uh, <coughs> the, uh, uh, but in, in those days, the, uh, you, 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 you talk about these, hear about reporters today who'll spend weeks and weeks and weeks on a story. Uh, in those days, we were a very small staff in, in, uh, at the Constitution, and uh, uh, you know, everybody had a, had a story every day, at least one. I mean, I, I, we used to keep up kind of have a running a record about the number of uh, bylines that one reporter would have on page one in one day. I mean, that's unheard of today, I mean, to have more than one. Um, but I mean, I, I don't know who holds the record. I think the most I ever got was like four. And, and uh, you know, it, but that was, that was one day story. There's a, there's a great, uh, great movie about newspapers called The Paper. Uh, and, Robert Duvall is the managing editor of this, of this newspaper, and, and he's, he's talking about uh, uh, the, how difficult the job is. He says it's the only business in the world where every day, every day you come in, and you stare, you start from zero, you start with a blank page, and it's your job to figure out what goes on that page and get it there. So every, every day starts with zero. So you've got to you got to you got to come in every day, knowing that uh, that there's stories out there and that you there's stories out there in the naked city and you've got to get them. Mm -hmm. How about a political reporter? What does it what does it take to make a good political reporter? I don't. I, I never have have been able to draw the difference between political reporting and any other kind of reporting. It's. Uh, I, I think probably you've got to be. Maybe if there is a, a if there is a a difference, uh, you've got to be a little bit more. Um, on the. You got to be a little bit more like a politician uh, to to really. Get involved with them. I mean, you you got to be more personable. A lot of reporters are. You know, I think I mentioned to you in the earlier that uh, you know a reporter is a, 
as an unusual uh, combination of inferiority and superiority complexes. And, uh, but many, many reporters are, you know, can, they all, always try to be behind the scenes and not be out and out and about. But uh, in a political setting, uh, you are. You're, you're, you're occasionally on stage. And in, in, in my day, not as much as they are today. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, if we'd gone on a TV program, we'd probably been fired. Because uh, you know that was uh, that was another media that was our competitor. You know why why are we going to go on a Sunday talk show? Uh, and, and that certainly has changed dramatically. Uh, a, a, a political reporter is now also a commentator on TV. Um, but you you're you're out uh, you're out in a political setting. You're, you're in conventions and caucus uh, 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 fundraising. Uh, gatherings and all kinds of uh, things where you, where you can't really lean up against the wall and just take notes. You've got to actually get out and engage with people. So that's probably one difference, but uh, otherwise it's just uh, just being a good reporter. How difficult is it to keep your personal political philosophy out of your stories? Um, well, first of all, there's no, there's no such, you know, it's what I teach when I teach journalism, is there's no such thing as objectivity. I mean, you, um, uh, you, you lose your objectivity when, when, when you're standing there in an interview and, uh, and, and you decide on the fly what's the most, what's the important thing the guy said that you write down. And then you, you lose it again when you go back into the newsroom and look at your notes and decide what's the most important thing that, that you're going to write and then you lose it again when you decide what's the most important thing you, you put in that lead paragraph that they base the headline on. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you, you can't, uh, you know, I've seen reporters do it, uh, do it differently where you, you couldn't tell they had an opinion. Uh, and, and they, you know, they try to, um, uh, to elicit uh, you know, but, but keeping that total distance from it to, to reporters who, who would, who would you know, challenge a politician by you know, stating, you know, I believe this, and state it uh, up front and, and just try to get a reaction out of it. But then when they get back and write it, it's fairly balanced count. Um, um, it's, it's, I think it's impossible to keep your total, keep your opinions out of things or, your, or, or who you are out of it, not your opinions. You, you're a reporter, you're not, a, you're not writing an editorial, you're not writing an opinion piece. You're, you're writing a story and, and you're covering it. I think that the, the, the key is just to, be, just to be fair and honest about it um, and, and not worry so much about where you're coming from on it. If, if, you're, uh, if, you're, if you're not setting out to, you know, to get a guy because you don't like him, then you may not like him. Uh, but uh, you may like him. I, I mean, I've, I've written stories, negative stories about people that, uh, that I really liked. You know, a lot of the Georgia politicians I really got along extremely well with, and they were, they were totally, uh, um, totally opposite, the, uh, opposite views uh, that I had on, on all kinds of subjects. We talk about it informally. But uh, you know, I think I was I always had a, uh, was always able to, to stay fair and honest to what the story was. So you never threw softballs or curveballs to po to politicians. Wouldn't say that. <laughs> I, I probably threw uh, you know a good pitcher mixes it up. <laughs> Did it, ever, did it ever bother you when politicians accused you or your newspaper of being biased? No, because we were we were extremely separate. I mean, the, the, from from the from the opinion pages uh, of the newspaper, um, that the the, um, the journal and the Constitution both were uh, had had very um, very set. Um, Editorial policies that were were the positions of the newspapers on uh, you know the Constitution was always the liberal paper by design, 
uh, the journal, even after they combined, was the conservative paper by design. That's the way it always was. And, and uh, uh, you know, but that was that was the editorial page. Uh, that, that was the editorial page only. The um, the reporters were, you know, you you were you were to be objective and impartial and, and fair and balanced. Right? Uh, uh, Hated using that. And, uh, I'm showing my prejudice now, but uh, uh, we really we were fair and balanced, I think. Well, in, in the reporting, in the in the news side, uh, the, the uh, uh, it, it, it was pretty independent. I mean, I, you know, I, I confess to you that I, I I personally liked Carter, Jimmy Carter, um, and uh, but my editor. Uh, at that time, the editor, not my editor, but the editorial page editor, uh, openly disliked Jimmy Carter, and, and uh, it was Reg, Reg Murphy, and uh, when, when the uh, uh, stories first broke that Carter was running for president, he's the one that wrote the column, Jimmy, who is running for what? And that, like, uh, I can't believe this, this, uh, this, this guy. And, you know, even, uh, it, it, it even went, uh, the, I guess the hands-off nature of, of the newspaper even went beyond the difference between the uh, the reporting side and the editorial side to the ownership side. When when stories broke uh, later on about how uh, how Carter financed his uh, gubernatorial campaign, it turned out that the lead contributor in that campaign was uh, Ann Cox Chambers, who is of course the uh, owner of the newspaper. And yet her editorial page editor, she was obviously very pro-Carter, became his ambassador to Belgium. Uh, and uh, the editor of her editorial page was anti-Carter. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there was, it, it, was, it was separate. Did it bother me? Um, not really, no. I mean, you know, we, you know the, the, um, my colleagues on the journal were getting it the other way. <laughs> they had, had flaming liberals uh, uh, on the reporting staff, and they were accused of working for the, you know, the John Birch Society newspaper, or the, or the ultra-conservative newspaper. Not so much as I was for working the liberal paper. <laughs> Getting back to the Carter administration for just a minute, was there a point in Carter's four years as governor when you suspected that he was running for president? You know, uh, I, I was I was trying to peg the the time. I, I think the actual announcement that he was running took us by surprise. But I've actually found a clipping uh, that, uh, from a story I'd written in uh, in seventy four, I think. Uh, and, and Carter, it was not commonly known then that. Well, yeah, maybe it was. Maybe it was a little earlier than that. But it was a, he was going to a Southern Governors Conference, and there was some reference about uh, the agenda would uh, it, how he played against that agenda would uh, would help him uh, uh, formulate his campaign for the presidency. But uh, uh, I, I think we uh, we were all um, um, so. Um, Taken aback by the notion that a Southern governor, other than Wallace, had a, had a shot at a national uh, on a national platform. That when he did actually uh, make it known that he was running, it, it did take us a little by surprise. Um, but there were, you know, Hamilton Jordan um, was certainly working on the the grand scheme as early as what seventy one, seventy two. You know, Carter had gotten made it to uh, the cover of Time magazine as a as a New South governor. Um, you know, there was a, there was a big spread about uh, that. He was he was kind of taking over that mantle from Carl Sanders, and and um, uh, you know, there was certainly the speculation uh, in the national media that Carter was going to run, and he was actually running. Hmm. Uh, getting back to something we talked about earlier. Uh, situation of private lives versus public lives. We mentioned Gary Hart's problems and Julian Bond had some problems. Where do you draw the line? Um, I, 
That's that's a that's a very difficult question, and I don't I don't know that that I can answer it. Uh, I, I've seen. I, I, it's kind of like you know obscenity when you see it. Uh, you kind of know you, you're crossing the line when you cross it. But uh, you know it, it became a, a big issue. Character became a big issue in the Carter presidential campaign, of course, when. Uh, when he had the uh, infamous Playboy interview, Playboy magazine interview, and confessed to having lust in his heart, and then, uh, and then everybody uh, jumped all over that trying to figure out who he was lusting for, uh, and it was all kinds of speculation about it, and uh, it, it, it just it, it became pretty wild. In in the Julian Bond thing, uh, it basically it was a story of. Um, that should have been, uh, I mean, he was, he had already lost the campaign by the time the story broke. And he was, he was, his, his career was pretty much over. Uh, now, to, to the extent that, that, uh, that some of the problems that surfaced might have contributed to his downfall politically, which they no doubt did, there might have been some importance to it for a historical record, but, uh, but I, mean, I think we went a little overboard with that. Um, I mean, we were looking into all kinds of things, basically a, 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 a family squabble and a personal tragedy. So, and, uh, but uh, uh, the newspaper at that time had about 10 or 12 reporters on that story pretty much full time, and we were uh, covering everything that moved on it. And uh, you know, it was, it was not always very comfortable. Um, you know, Gary Hart. Um, it, with, you know, politicians would make uh, would make issues of their morality, and then you'd find out that they were not being very moral people. I think uh, you know one of the classic examples, of course, is Newt Gingrich, uh, and um, he was a uh, you know hammering Bill Clinton for his morality and, and doing the same thing. Yeah, so I think. In that case, it was it was probably fair game, and, and um, the the character of, of your leaders is is always an issue, and and um, you you you, ha you have to push it a little bit, but I don't know where the line is. What do you think of political coverage in this country today, twenty four hours a day? Um, do we have political coverage in this country today? I assume that uh, you could loosely define uh, what we see on television 24 hours a day as pretty thorough political coverage. Uh, you can even find out when someone blows their nose. Mm -hmm. Is that good? What I, what I mostly see, and you know, I, I read there, there, I read some good political coverage, and, and, and um, I see very little of it on television. But uh, uh, I read some good reporting that's still going on. But what I see mostly is reporters interviewing each other, and uh, uh, reporters. Um, um, Comment, doing commentary, or what, what? What would have been a column in in, in our day? And you know, I never did. Uh, I never did want to write a political column. And uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of the political reporters uh, did. They would they write a weekly column on the editorial page, and, and uh, it would be more on a more toward of a. Um, you know, str stronger, st uh, more strongly opinionated uh, observations than than uh, than balanced reporting. But uh, you, you don't you don't see a lot of it. There's a there's a whole lot of gotcha journalism. There's a whole lot of um, um, just sc scratching the surface and nobody going going behind the scenes and, and figuring things out and, until they uh, you know ten years later do the documentary film. Mm -hmm. And then when it's too late to do anything about it, you uh, hear the real story. Mm -hmm. Well, there came a time in your life when you decided to leave the newspaper. What happened? <clears throat> the, um, I think the newspaper decided to leave me was uh, <laughs> basically what happened. Um, the, um, oh, I, was, uh, uh, I was getting uh, 
you know, kids, uh, a kid was getting college age and it wasn't making a great deal of money and, and uh, uh, I had an opportunity to, uh, to leave the Atlanta newspapers and, and start a uh, bureau for a, a, a computer magazine in the, in the late 1980s. Uh, it, was, it was actually kind of interesting that there were, uh, you know, the, the personal computer had just taken off and was just changing the world. <clears throat> and there were a lot of publications that sprang up around just covering the personal, the PC industry, and and uh, and one of them, and they were making money hand over fist. And you know, I, I went to work for one of them and a colleague. Uh, uh, the, the two leading publications were PC Week and InfoWorld, and and, I, and within a week, I, I became the Atlanta bureau chief for. PC Week and a colleague, uh, Robert Snowden Jones, became the Atlanta bureau chief for uh, uh, InfoWorld, and, and, and we were, were competitors once again. He had been a journal guy, uh, and I was a Constitution guy. He wasn't. He was a business reporter. Is the only difference. And uh, so I, I uh, did that really to, uh, as a career move, to frankly make more money, and. Um, it lasted for until the first recession hit, and the computer industry went down the tubes that time, and, and I, I wound up uh, uh, looking for work once again. And, and the recession was on us in full swing, and the uh, the newspaper was laying people off. News organizations all over the country were, and I really gravitated more then toward public relations side of things. So it kind of left me. <laughs> but I, I, even, even when I, I left, I kind of, I always kind of fancied myself as still a reporter. And even in this job, uh, one, of, one of the things that I do is, the, uh, is, is publish the, uh, the alumni magazine, uh, Bernal uh, Window. And that, that helps me keep my hand in as a reporter. And I, I, I did a lot of that a, a, even while I was, uh, in, in the public relations agency business, I still freelanced for magazines and so mm -hmm. forth on the side. What do you do in your spare time now? Write mystery novels? Oh, I've been uh, I've been working on the great American novel since uh, since I was in college. I've got one novel that I've been working on, and, and uh, uh, I don't want to give it away because one of these days I may actually f get time to finish it. But uh, it's it's a it's a political. Novel, but it's set in the um, uh, in the Confederacy, and um, I say it's a political novel. It's it's got a lot of politics in it, and for a lot of the characters, I, I've, in the reading in, uh, I've done, the research I've done on the, uh, for the novel, uh, you could see some of those same guys still hanging outside the Speaker's office in in the Georgia House. So I'm drawing a lot of. Uh, a lot of uh, drawing on that a lot for uh, developing characters and so forth. Well, you've had a very interesting career. Have we uh, failed to mention something you would like to say? Well, on the on the um, I think I've, pretty, I've made a few notes, but um, I, I was, uh, you know, the, the, the 74 legislative session I mentioned was, was kind of interesting for, on, on a number. Of, there, were, there was a lot going on. Of course, uh, you know, Carter was running for president. Uh, so that was happening. That was uh, the whole backdrop of everything. We were starting to see national reporters coming into the Capitol all the time. Uh, we had um, a governor's race that was in full swing, and it seemed like everybody in the legislature was running for governor. We had uh, uh, you had Busby, of course. Uh, uh, you had uh, um, uh, what was the guy's name from? Uh, Columbus, um, Harry, Harry, Jackson. Harry Jackson was running, state senator from Columbus, and Bobby Rowan was running. The big issue other than, than Carter was campaign ethics, campaign financial reform, and, and uh, each of these guys were trying to outdo them each other on that. Uh, so uh, 
uh, you know, you had a, Busby had his ethics bill uh, going through, and, and you had Bobby Rowan pushing a stronger ethics bill. Bobby is state senator from uh, Enigma, uh, funniest guy in the, in the legislature. Uh, absolutely hilarious and uh, he he uh, when he announced his candidacy for governor to, in the spirit of the ethics and campaign finance reform he decided to limit his campaign contributions to two hundred and fifty dollars and it was interesting Bobby was was extremely popular in in the Atlanta area and could have raised a lot of money and he had, he had a lot of uh, a lot of backing from you know Buckhead folks and, and uh, uh, so he might have uh, might have fared a lot better if he had not put that limit on himself. And I, I teased him about it afterwards after he dropped out of the race. And he said, "Yeah, it's, a, it's the last time I go into a hatchet fight without a hatchet." <laughs> but then uh, the, the interesting thing was, uh, Bert, uh, a, a lot of this ethics legislation was aimed at two people. It was aimed at, at, at Maddox, who was uh, who was getting financed. Uh, Primarily by uh, by a lot of a lot of big money and interest. Uh, Gene Holly uh, in Augusta area was uh, was really behind him. But the other one that was aimed at was uh, was Bert Lance, uh, who was transportation head of the Department of Transportation and and and, um, and a real strong Carter ally and a banker and richer than God. And uh, so everybody was was kind of knew that Bert was going to throw a lot of money, uh, either through uh, bank loans or, or contribution, personal wealth, and, and so a lot of the the legislation was aimed at uh, at, at, at penetrating that. And, and Busby Busby campaigned against uh, uh, Bert. Uh, in the legislature, he didn't have to during the uh, during the campaign because he had already taken care of it in the legislative session and in creating the bill that uh, that ultimately became law and governed that campaign. And um, it, 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 and Bert, true to form, did get a lot of money. I think he had some bank loans, some major major bank loans to start his campaign with, and, and Busby, uh, uh, we thought, did not. Only to turn out that Busby had uh, uh, gotten um, a, a loan from CNS Bank of Albany, but had about 40 people co-sign it, and, and and he listed it in his campaign reports as individual contributions up to the limit. I think it was two thousand dollars, and so it didn't show up as a big bank loan. It showed up as individual con contributions. So the first uh, the first order of business for the uh, the newly constituted state ethics commission in in the new George Busby administration was to investigate George Busby. So, so I always thought that was kind of <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. It was just a uh, it was a um, it was more of a um, I don't know it, I don't know if it was an ethics violation. I don't I don't want to pass judgment on it. It was certainly interesting to report on. Uh, and um, uh, said, but he was, you know, exonerated primarily because the uh, ethics commission didn't have any power. <laughs> Anything else? Um, no. Um, you have nice handwriting. Huh. I t I'm accused of taking too many notes, and I used to have really good handwriting. I mean, when I was in uh, in elementary school, we had, we had writing. I mean, we all uh, in in schools they taught us handwriting. They had these uh, Parker pens that were very nice that they kept in little boxes, and they'd only pass them out during a writing class. But but we also wrote uh, with a um, uh, with a stylus that you dipped in an inkwell. It was almost like a quill pen. It was just a, it was a metal point on a stick of wood and you had an inkwell on your desk. And we I always come home covered with ink. And uh, But we, we learned the Palmer uh, handwriting method and, and I used to have, I, I won awards. I used to have great handwriting. Uh, but uh, 
I kind of lost it when I became a reporter and you're having to stand up in a phone booth in the rain <laughs> writing on one of these things and, uh, and then you get back to the newsroom and uh, yeah. I, I can't be, uh, I have to be objective here and just sort of guess what that says. <laughs> you had mentioned uh, Chris McNair and yeah. um, running a campaign for him. Yeah. But I don't think we caught that on camera. Oh, okay. You want to talk about that at all? Or? Sure. Sure. Are we rolling? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I mentioned that uh, you know, I covered the, the, the Shambliss trial uh, for McNair, and um, uh, I mean, McNair was a witness in the trial, and, and he, um, uh, I got to know he and his wife, uh, Maxine, just peripherally there. They, they were in and out of the courtroom, and, and I mean, it wasn't a social occasion. They were, uh, you know, witnesses were kept away from the courtroom except when they were testifying and um, so we you know other than uh, just just passing um, I didn't really know him uh, but uh, on a friendly basis but uh, some years later I, I had uh, I'd actually gone to my, my friend Milo Dakin that I mentioned uh, had left uh, the, the reporting business and was working for as a lobbyist in Alabama uh, and his uh, major client uh, was the uh, uh, Alab uh, Alabama Sports Association. Well, basically, that was the dog racing interest. Uh, that uh, there, were, there were two guys that, that, that pretty much had the market cornered. One was a, a guy from Auburn named uh, Milton McGregor who ran the, the track at uh, Victory Land and near uh, Montgomery, Tuskegee. And, um, and the other one was uh, a guy definitely from Alabama, Paul Bryant Jr. And he ran a track over near Tuscaloosa. And, and together they, uh, they formed this organization, basically a lobbying organization to protect the paramutual interests. And, and uh, uh, we, uh, and, and this is an interesting story. And Miller, uh, when Zell Miller ran for governor, he, uh, he campaigned, he had a very smart campaign. He had three issues and he, he kept his focus and he wouldn't talk about anything else. And one of them was the state lottery. That was his, his cornerstone. He was going to get the state lottery passed. Well, he's elected governor and that's his first legislation is the state lottery. Well, the, my, my friend uh, Milo and his uh, organization had done some polling uh, and they, they deduced that the uh, on Friday nights, uh, there were more tags uh, on the parking lot of Victory Land from DeKalb County in Georgia than there were from, and, and from Muscogee County than there were from Alabama. So uh, what, and they, were, they figured that there was only so many gambling dollars to go around and they wanted them spent at Victory Land and, and not in Georgia. So our, uh, Milo hired me to help with the campaign to uh, convince people of, about the evils of gambling in Georgia. And so we set out to beat the lottery and, um, and came very close to doing it in the House. And Milo had worked uh, for Tom Murphy and, and, uh, as, for a long time and knew everybody in the House. And uh, so we'd done some pretty heavy vote counting and even had um, there was, a, there was a legislator from Albany named John White who had been in the legislature then by about 20 years. And every term since he first got there, he had introduced a bill to have a lottery in Georgia. And we even had John White on our side. We convinced, uh, you know, we, we'd call it the Trojan horse. It was really, it was, it was actually being run by, uh, by one of Zell's buddies who was uh, 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 had been in the horse racing industry, Cot Campbell. And Zell got a lot of seed money for his campaign from Kentucky horse folks. I think James Carville had helped him line that up. So we, we had this big idea that it was a Trojan horse. It was just, gonna, you know, it was just the horse racing people once again trying to find some way to get uh, the, uh, the gambling prohibition removed from the Constitution. And, uh, and technically there was no gambling prohibition in the Constitution. It was a lottery prohibition. Uh, but we, uh, so we ran that campaign and, and then um, uh, lost by seven votes in the House after 
Miller got up early one morning and walked around the hotel knocking on doors and twisting arms. And it was, uh, it was, it was pretty interesting. <clears throat> the follow-up to that was uh, Birmingham, my hometown, uh, back in the uh, 80s when they, had, uh, they were chasing Johnstown, Pennsylvania as the city with the most, uh, uh, the highest unemployment rate. They, they had decided that paramutual betting was not so evil if it created jobs, so they built a big horse track in Birmingham. But it, it was never really a great horse racing area, <laughs> so the track had uh, fallen on hard times. And uh, we, Milton McGregor, one of the, one of the uh, Milo's clients, uh, was uh, going to take over the horse track and turn it into a dog track. And we had to do a referendum campaign. This is a long story to get to Chris McNair, but I'm getting there. And uh, McNair was, was supportive of that referendum. So we got to know him a little bit during that campaign, and we lost. Uh, went back the following year to, to start the campaign again. I was actually running media for the campaign and, and, uh, for Milo, and, and uh, we, we went back again the next year, and uh, McNair decided that uh, all of a sudden that he would run for the United States Senate uh, in the Democratic primary against an incumbent named Richard Shelby. And Shelby was extremely popular, extremely powerful, and had a whole lot of money. And uh, McNair was uh, uh, you know, a black county commissioner from Alabama whose, whose major um, claim to fame was he was an environmentalist. Uh, and uh, he had uh, less than $100,000. Shelby, I think, had like $3.6 million in the bank when the campaign started. And, and Chris asked Milo if, um, if, if they would help him run his campaign, and they, of course, could not do it because Shelby had been very supportive as well, so they had to stay out of it. And Milo uh, asked me if I'd go work for McNair. And he put together a group of, uh, of, of people that he knew. We didn't know each other, but we had different, different skill sets to run the campaign. And uh, uh, there was a guy who uh, actually was going to be the campaign manager who was uh, um, uh, a member of the um, kind of an elite ranger unit in the Army Reserve. And I mean, the week we got started, he got activated to go to Barcelona, the Olympics were going on, there were some terrorism threats, and his unit got called up and he was gone. So I, he, I'd never run a campaign before. <laughs> so there I am running, you know, a white boy from Birmingham running a, a, a U.S. Senate campaign with a line of the civil rights movement. And, and um, so it was, uh, we, uh, we set out and did what we could. Uh, we. Um, Shelby just uh, beat us like a drum. I mean, he, he first he, he ignored the McNair totally. He ran a very smart campaign, uh, and uh, you know we uh, we 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 could only buy a little bit of television time, but we uh, everywhere we bought television time, we won. So, but unfortunately, that was only three of more than fifty counties. <laughs> so, um, the only issue that we really um, resonated or got Shelby to engage on it all was uh, we had we, you know, the stories in the paper about the Republicans courting him. And, and we, uh, we kind of rolled it out that Shelby had a deal that he would win the, uh, he would win the, uh, uh, win the primary and then switch over and become a Republican and not run and, uh, you know, had the general election sewn up. Well, he, of course, denied that. And true to, true to the statement, he, he he stayed in. Uh, they had a Republican candidate in the general election. He, he, I think. I think uh, Shelby. I don't know this. I think Shelby probably paid his qualifying fee, but uh, uh -huh. uh, beat him by about a million percent. It was just not even a race. And then shortly after that, switched to the Republican Party. But uh, so we made up an issue, and it turned out to be the only true issue in the campaign. But it was. Um, uh, it, was, it was pretty interesting. Uh, McNair was, uh, was uh, such an honest, straightforward guy that he, he thought even that paying street money um, 
was unseemly. Should I explain what street money is? It's sure. a, basically, it's 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 cash in a campaign that uh, uh, that is used for. It's it's kind of petty cash, but it's a large chunk of petty cash, and it's used to mostly in get out the vote efforts. Uh, if you got you, you, you're trying to you, you're trying to engage a local political organization to go to nursing homes and. Uh, you know, uh, other other places, and get, uh, provide transportation to the polls for people, and, and uh, you know, it's money to buy gas for the vans and rent vans and buses and so forth to print sample ballots. But anybody that has a political organization um, uh, usually likes to get involved in the street money thing. That's particularly uh, it was particularly uh, heavy in Birmingham in the African American with their African American organizations and in, in the in the referendum campaign I, I was I was buying media and doing doing media in the uh, horse racing dog racing referendum and one of the organizations that we engaged was was Mayor Arrington's Richard Arrington's organization and uh, uh, I don't know for some, some reason I decided to pay that money by check, and I wrote personal checks for it um, out of out of uh, you know business account. I mean, they basically the the uh, campaign hired my business to do the, the advertising and public relations for the for the campaign. So I, I sort of subcontracted that part of it out uh, because we were doing a lot of sample ballot printing and advertising and in, in, in local papers and radio and so forth and as part of the street campaign uh, and Arrington was uh, wanting to buy all that stuff himself so rather than just shell out a bunch of cash I wrote checks it turned out to be a really uh, nice thing because two or three years later uh, uh, I'm in my office in Atlanta and a, a young FBI agent comes in and asked me if I'd had anything to do with Mayor Arrington, that they were investigating for all sorts of corruption, and I told them that we had, uh, you know, used his organization in the campaign, and uh, he, uh, I said, he, the agent said, do you have any record of that? And I said, uh, yeah, I think I, I, I wrote checks for it, and, and he pulled out the check, and he said, it was this check, so it was, I was kind of glad I had, but, but McNair wouldn't even play at that level. He 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 wouldn't do it. And the the tragedy is that uh, uh, you know just just recently, um, uh, as, as strong a reputation as he had for integrity and honesty, uh, uh, he you know he's uh, just started a prison term. He's uh, he's um, convicted of corruption related to his service in county commission just a few years ago. Well, David, thank you very much for being our guest. You've been very interesting, and we certainly appreciate it. Thank you.